is Chris Phillips. I'm one of the pastors here at Journey Point. I'm pumped you're here with us today. Uh, I'm really excited. This is the last message in a series that we're calling Uncertain. Uh, and we've just been answering some, some kind of random, hard, nuanced questions about Christianity, which has been uh, really, really fun. Uh, do you know this? On average, each of you will tell four lies today. Seriously, each of you will tell four lies. You may have already told four lies. You may have maxed out already this morning. Your spouse or someone next to you, close to you, could probably tell you that. Uh, men, you're going to tell six. <laughs> ladies, you're going to tell three. So I don't, just give it up for the ladies. They're a little bit more truer to that. No, you're still lying. Don't say you're feeling good about yourself. Uh, hey, the most common lie amongst men and women is nothing's wrong. I'm fine. Right? Maybe you've said that this morning as you were kind of frustratingly doing something around the house when something was actually wrong. Uh, and how about this? If you tell four lies a day, that's only 1,500 lies a year. So we're good. No, no problem. Just 1,500 lies a year. These are real statistics, by the way. I'm not making it up. Uh, adults, when you meet somebody, maybe when you high-five somebody here, if you have a 10-minute conversation with them while we have a cookout after service today, if you have 10 minutes, someone in that 10-minute conversation both of you, according to studies, would say that you're gonna lie two to three times during that conversation. So be very skeptical as you're walking out there and having a hamburger or some ice cream from Nugs Ice Cream, as we have a truck there today. Uh, no, in all serious, parents in the room, you can probably attest to this. 90% of kids learn to lie before age four, most of which are gonna tell their first lie by the age of two or three. I didn't do it. He did it, she did it, somebody else, you see it. And so they either taught that or that's innate in them, right? So here's the deal, we lie for three reasons. There's three reasons that we lie. Number one is this, to make ourselves look good. 33% of resumes have lies on their resumes. So you bosses in here, as you're scrolling through resumes, just know that 33% of the ones that come across your desk have lies on them. Uh, number two, the second thing is to get out of trouble. I didn't do it, he did. You know, as my kids say that all day long. I'm like, man, they're only saying it so they can get out of trouble. Did you know this? Anybody in the medical profession, 40% of patients actually lie to their doctors because they want to get out of trouble. Uh, for those that don't know, I was in medical sales for about 10 years. One of my favorite stories surrounding this was uh, there was a patient. Now, patient was five foot nine, and the patient, honestly, was a big, big guy. He weighed over uh, the maximum limit for the table. They had to get reinforcements. So he's a big guy, right? And so they're doing, I was in the cardiac cath lab. Uh, they're doing a procedure on him. They put stents in. They give heart casts and everything. And so this patient had clearly got some stuff going on. So the doctor, who is of a Pakistan descent, one of my favorite doctors, uh, he's in there and he's telling them, hey, you need some lifestyle changes. And the guy, no kidding, looked at him and said, doctor, I don't know what's wrong. I work out every single day and I eat healthy. And the, the doctor, again, Pakistan distant, looked at him and says, and I'm Bill Clinton. So, and so the, I, I kid you not, I die, that's my favorite story from medical sales. I'm like, dude, that was funny. But 40% are going to lie so they can get out of trouble. Uh, the number three thing is to avoid hurting someone's feelings. So 80% of women are told to have been giving white lies to make their friends feel better or not to hurt their feelings. So that's the third reason we lie. Many of you, as you pass out Connection Point, you'll be like, great message, Chris, and you're lying. You're just trying not to hurt my feelings. I get it. It's okay. 80% of you. So here's the deal, though. Not all lies are harmless. Uh, nine out of 10 middle school-aged kids, they're going to look like this in their classroom, <laughs> cheating on homework or on tests. And for those of us that had to live before word processing was so big, we, we knew how to cup our hand and we knew how to write really, really small on index cards, right? Kids now, they have it made. They can just type it up in real small font. It's clean, you know. Nine out of 10 middle school kids will cheat on test and or homework according to studies. And then how about this? 15 million Americans will be subject to identity fraud this year, causing about $50 billion in damages. So not all lies are just easy. You see, ultimately, we lie for a reason. There's, there's a reason behind it. We want to paint a different picture of what reality is. The reason I bring that up this morning is because today we're finishing up this uncertain series by talking about the linchpin of Christianity, the thing that holds it all together, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. And so the first week we said, is the Bible, is it a reliable document? Is this Bible a reliable document? 
Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We said that we found out that it is a historical and reliable document. Week two, we talked about God and who God is and some of the nuanced things about God. If he says who he is, why do these certain things happen? And we said, God is who he said he is. And today, we're talking son of God, walk on water, miracle performing, dead raised to life, Jesus. And we're talking about lies because you see, if, if the claims about Jesus were a different picture of reality, or lies, as most people and some skeptics would say they are, then the basis of Christianity is destroyed. The very basis and foundation of Christianity is done for. The, the literal foundation of everything that we believe comes through the person and work of Jesus. Everything hinders on him and the account of his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, there was a Chicago Tribune article uh, editor uh, who spent two years of his life. He was an editor at the Chicago Tribune. He was tired of the claims of Jesus. His wife had become a follower of Jesus. And he said, you know what? I'm going to set out to disprove everything about Jesus. Uh, and so for two years, Lee Strobel uh, set out to do that. Lee Strobel is now a Christian speaker, wrote the book, The Case for Christ, because at the end of his two years, he could not evidentially prove that Jesus didn't die was buried and was raised again. And he became a follower of Jesus and took a journey with Jesus and wrote a book called The Case for Christ and others. A movie came out uh, not too far, ag uh, far along ago about it as well called The Case for Christ. So no matter your belief in Jesus though, I don't care where you stand on this side or that side as far as is he a liar uh, or is he truly who he says he is, the one thing that we cannot question is was he an actual person that lived and walked the earth? So he did. Every historical document that we have from followers of Jesus to antagonists of Jesus to those people that were indifferent, everyone confirms historically, evidentially, that he did actually live and walk the face of the earth. Uh, if you believe in people like Aristotle, if you believe in people like Julius Caesar and other historical people, you would also have to attest Jesus is who he said he was in terms of living on this earth because the same historical documents are proof of his actual life. And so what you have to say is, okay, he was alive, he was there, he lived this earth. But the question becomes, is, are the claims about Jesus and are the things that he did and are the things that we see in the Bible and read about that we've heard and continue to hear for 2,000 plus years, are they true? Are they real? Or is it just a different picture of reality? See, one of the best questions, hands down best question in the Bible, in my opinion, comes from Mark, the book we're actually going to be in today, but it's in, in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 29, and it, it says this, it's Jesus quoting, talking to Peter, and he says, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? See, here's the deal, we will all ultimately have to answer that question, who do we say Jesus is? Some would say that Jesus was a really good teacher. He was a, a great moral person. He was a prophet. He was these high things. As a matter of fact, if you look at religions across the board, they all include Jesus into their religion. They would say, he's a good teacher. He was a great person. He was a great moral teacher. He was a prophet. They all include him in their religions as this type of person. And it may be true, in essence, that he was a good teacher and that he was a great moral person. But you have to think about it from this standpoint as well. If he was a great teacher or a great moral person, then in actuality, he would be a liar for claiming some of the things that he claimed. Because you can't claim what you claim and just be a good moral teacher or a good prophet because he claimed to be the son of God. And so what we have to look at is one of my favorite quotes. It's from a guy named C.S. Lewis. I had a quote from him last week as well. C.S. Lewis is a converted Christian from atheism. And this is what he said about Jesus. He said this. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis goes on and says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that he said would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God 
or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, Lewis says, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. So liar, lunatic, or Lord, who is Jesus? You see, because of the claims that he made for his nearly 30 plus years on earth, Jesus was either a lunatic and out of his mind, he was a flat out liar, or he was Lord and is Lord, who he said he was, the son of God. You know, I think C.S. Lewis is absolutely right, hits it spot on, and I actually think he gets it from a chapter in the Bible out of Mark. We're going to be in Mark 3. It's going to be on page 889 of the Black Bibles that are scattered in and throughout the room. Uh, as always, if you don't own a copy of the Bible, if you don't have a copy of the Scriptures, that's your gift. It's our gift to you. We'd love for you to have it. Uh, that is yours. But we're going to be on page 889. Mark, John Mark, as he's called, uh, is actually uh, a follower of Jesus. Uh, he's found in the New Testament portion of the Bible, uh, and he's one of the gospel accounts. So one of the four books that talk about the life, the death, and the ministry of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus from four different vantage points. And John Mark wrote it from the account of Peter. He wrote from Peter's perspective. And so let me pray. Let's look at what the scriptures say about this man named Jesus. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for who you are. God, for all that you are doing, I thank you for your word that you give us. Jesus, I thank you that we can look to it as reliable. We can trust in who you say you are because of it. And God, we can use it in our life here 2,000 years later to figure out who was this man named Jesus. Speak to us today, and it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. All right, so look at me, at, uh, look at, with me at Mark 3, uh, and starting in verse 20, again on page 889. Here's what it says. It says, Jesus entered a house... The crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When, when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to impact those that are closest to you with something and found out that they really didn't want to trust you for anything that you were saying? I mean, sometimes it's incredibly hard to impact those closest to us. And maybe rightfully so, because they probably know us a little bit better than others do, and it's hard for them to trust whatever it is that we're trying to tell them. Uh, I've mentioned before that I wasn't raised in a church home, uh, and so I, I lived a large portion of my life uh, not looking like I was on a journey with Jesus. Uh, the bulk majority of that was in college and in high school, those two time frames. You, you would not have been able to look at my life and be like, man, that guy is in a solid relationship with Jesus. And, um, and so then I became, though, out of college, uh, man, I decided to just get back on my journey with Jesus and start following him and start trying to read and understand more and do these certain things. Uh, and so as I did that, uh, I ultimately spent about 10 years in medical sales. Uh, the Lord called me into ministry. Uh, and so I became a full-time pastor at a church uh, in Tennessee and then obviously ultimately moved here to start Journey Point. Now, the reason I say that is because after I moved here about about eight months after moving here, I saw a name on a Facebook post. It was a guy that I went four years of high school with. He probably saw me cheating and cupping my hand like that a couple of times, uh, and then lived two years in college with. And so inevitably, when you meet people, it comes down to, hey, so why are you here? What do you do, right? We, we have to classify everybody by what they do. And so I told him I was a pastor. We came here to start a church. I wish I would have taken a picture of the look on his face. <laughs> Uh, See, so I didn't major in evangelism in college. I didn't major in anything close to evangelism. So, like, he was like, huh? It's Chris Phillips. It's the same Chris Phillips I went to high school and college with. It, yes, I promise you. You see, sometimes it is just harder to convince those that are closest to us of what is going on in our lives and what we are doing. But, hear me out. It doesn't mean that that can't happen, right? I mean, God moved in my life. I am a pastor of a church. And so it doesn't mean that just because we can't trust those things, I'm some sort of lunatic because I came to start a church. See, Jesus' family knew him. 
They knew who he was. And in fact, when you read this passage, it says they tried to restrain him. When they said they were restraining him, the same word in the original language is actually arrest him. So they were actually on the same page as the Jewish authorities that were saying, hey, you're claiming to be the son of God. You need to be thrown over here. We need to ultimately crucify you, right? And Jesus' family was doing the same thing. In fact, if you flip a couple of pages in Mark 6, 5, it actually says that Jesus couldn't do miracles in his family's hometown because of their unbelief. That's how strong their unbelief was for who Jesus was claiming to be. And here's the thing. Never forget this. When we look philosophically at this claim of Jesus being this lunatic and out of his mind, nothing else backs it up. When we say Jesus is lunatic, there's nothing in there that backs it up. Because to say that someone is crazy, there needs to be actions that back that up. I mean, to, to say someone is crazy, there has to be something there. Otherwise, we're just making claims. Actions, they usually stem from the heart, and we usually see people backing up things of the heart into real life. Because if if your belief doesn't lead to action, it's not true belief. So these claims that Jesus was a lunatic, we have to say, is there anything that backs that up? Is it true belief? When you and I scroll social media now, we see crazy things going on all over the world, and we see crazy people behind them. I mean, you can actually physically see crazy people putting their belief into action and doing crazy things. But just because Jesus claimed to be the son of God didn't mean his actions looked anything like that of a lunatic or a crazy person. In fact, philosophically and practically speaking, when we look at the leadership, when we look at the philosophy, when we look at the actions and the deeds of Jesus running to the least of these, those that other people were not willing to go and help, When we look at those types of things, as as well as his just kind of overall general disposition towards moral purity and all of those things, none of his actions show that he was crazy. His actions backed up someone with a sound mind and someone with intellect and integrity. So if we say he's crazy, then we're ultimately saying that he didn't know his claims were false. Because that's what crazy people do. Crazy people make claims and they believe in their heart that it's true. So we're saying if Jesus is crazy, then he didn't know his claims were false and he must have been a madman. And if he's a madman, his mind is deluded and it would have been impossible for him to live this morally pure life, this intellect and sound mind life where we see these religious truths, this knowledge of the situation. This philanthropy, this calculated decisions, all these things that look like someone with intellect and a sound mind, not a deluded one. So there's no way he was a lunatic. There's no way he was crazy. So he's not a lunatic, acting like he didn't know his claims were false, which means he did know his claims were false. And he knew that and he said it anyways, which makes him a liar. So he was a liar. Okay, well, let's look at that. Mark 3, 22. He says this. It says, the scribes and Pharisees, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said this. He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. Jesus said, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he's finished. You see, this, this passage and piece of the passage, they're indicating that Jesus is a liar. You're not who you say you are. You're actually with Satan casting out demons. They're saying that he wasn't Lord as he claimed to be, but that he was possessed by Beelzebul, which is just another word for Satan. Then Jesus quickly dispels that, says, bro, that doesn't even make sense. I don't, that's like Chris's language. It's not CSB or anything like that. Bro, that does not even make sense. It's what I would have said. And so when we see his claim on this, he's saying, why, why would Satan drive out his own demons? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't advance the mission. See, because a house divided doesn't do anything to further the mission. In your own homes, when you're on separate pages, it doesn't further the mission of what you're trying to accomplish. So if Jesus knew that he wasn't God, 
and he still made these claims, he was a flat-out liar. Quite frankly, if he was a liar, Jesus is one of the biggest hypocrites on the face of the earth. I mean, Jesus, it, believer or non-believer in Jesus and his claims, anyone can say that he was one of the most profound teachers on things like moral purity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, telling the truth in all of these things, living a moral life, loving your neighbor. Some of the most sound advice that we live by today, even if we are a believer or non-believer in Jesus. And so if he was a liar, Jesus was a hypocrite. I mean, a flat-out hypocrite. So tell me, how can a hypocrite, a liar, a con man, and ultimately a fool leave us with some of the most profound teaching that is ever found on the face of the earth still today? I, I mean, could an imposter live a morally pure life the way that Jesus did? And again, when you study the practical and philosophical reasons for lying, like we mentioned even to begin the message, we look at things that uh, police detectives look at in other people. They look at three things. I said them earlier. They look at one, making themselves look good. They look at two, to get out of trouble. They look three, did this person or this suspect avoid hurting someone's feelings or the situation? A couple of others they look at are also financial gain, sexual interests or desires, and pursuit of power. Those are all things that police detectives today look at in suspects to determine whether they're telling the truth or not. And when we look at these, none of them make sense for what Jesus was doing. I mean, his lifestyle already had followers. So to claim something so bold as to be the son of God would not help him, but it would actually hurt that situation. I mean, number two, to get out of trouble, <laughs> lying about being the son of God actually got him into more trouble than it did getting out of trouble. So that doesn't make sense either. Number three, hurting someone's feelings. All he did was hurt people's feelings by saying he was the son of God. His family didn't even like him. So number three doesn't make sense either. He also wasn't in it for financial gain. There was none there. There were no sexual interests or desires attested to him. And it wasn't in for pursuit of power. It actually limited him and everything that he did from man's eyes. None of those things add up when we study, is he lying about what he is saying? I mean, basically, it would have been worse for Jesus to lie in this. As a matter of fact, he ends up, because of his claim, dying on a cross, being murdered. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if my man was lying, like, dude, he went to extreme length to keep that lie going. <laughs> I've got four kids. Three of them are 10, 8, and 6. We see a lot of lies. Usually all I have to do is like threaten screen time or technology or something like that. And all of a sudden the truth just comes pouring out. <laughs> Jesus was beaten. He was bruised. He was flogged. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was murdered. So I mean, based on what we know of him, the actions that we see from his life, we see zero evidence that backs up him either being a lunatic or a liar. I mean, here's the deal. Look at this graphic. If, if he didn't know his claims were false, then he had a deluded mind, and he ended up being a lunatic. Uh, if he did know his claims were false, he was a liar, he was then a hypocrite, and ultimately a fool for going to the cross for it. So, know his claims were false, deluded mind, you're a lunatic. Uh, sorry, don't know your claims were false. Knew your claims were false, liar, hypocrite, fool for dying for it. So let's look at the last claim. Is he Lord? Look at verse 27. It says this, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder the house. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has forgiveness, but is, uh, never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So whoever takes Satan, Jesus said, whoever takes the strong man, this is who he's talking about, whoever takes Satan except for someone more powerful than him, the Lord does, that's who. Jesus makes the claim again here that he's the son of God. He says, uh, tell, I, truly I tell you, people will be forgiven of all sins. Only the son of God can make that claim. 
You see, Jesus took our place. He was murdered and then resurrected on the third day to fulfill prophecies like we talked about week one to make his claims about being the son of God true. <laughs> now, skeptic in the room is going, bro, if you believe someone was raised from the dead, maybe you're the lunatic. <laughs> and, and hey, rightfully so when we just look at it at face value. But let's talk about these three things. Here's what we do know. Jesus was alive. We know that Jesus was alive. Every historical document over and over again said he was an actual person that existed. Second thing, we know Jesus was dead. Every historical document, ones that you would believe about everybody else, make the claim over and over again, Jesus was dead. And I believe the third thing is this, he was alive again. Now, his resurrection, here's what we know. His body was not in the tomb. Even his enemies, even antagonists, even people that were indifferent, as well as his followers, all make the claim and show historically Jesus' body was not in the tomb. It was never found, and it is still not found to this day. So even his enemies say Jesus is not there. Then you factor in some eyewitness accounts. There are over nine eyewitness accounts from followers of Jesus and non-followers and different people of Jesus and antagonist people that were against Jesus. And they all make the claim that it was in fact true that these people saw the resurrected Jesus. So followers, non-followers, and indifferent people say he was seen afterwards. More than nine accounts. They all point to the same thing. Matter of fact, most of those people that made that account later ended up dying because of their belief in it and proclaimed that message until their death. No ifs, ands, or buts. His followers, they called him Lord. Even the beginning of this book we're in, in Mark, here's what it says in Mark 1 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In chapter 8, verse 5, Peter actually answers the question I started with today, who do you say that I am? And he says this, you are the Messiah. Another follower, her name was Martha, written in the gospel according to John. She says this, Martha said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. John eleven twenty seven. 27. So what now? I mean, either Jesus is a lunatic, he is a liar, or he is Lord. I'm going with Lord. I, I, I'm going with Lord. I, in fact, I don't even think people make the decision not to claim him as Lord do so because of academic intellect. I think they do so because of the moral implications of the way we have to live our lives afterwards. The academic intellect is there. So people aren't making their claims because that. It's because of the moral implications on our lives. And so, great Chris, what does that mean for me today? H how do I move with this? What do I do because the Bible is worthy and trustworthy and reliable? Because God is who he says he is and because Jesus was the son of God. What do I do? You see, here's the deal. If he is Lord, we either have to follow him or reject him, but be responsible accordingly to our decision. If he's Lord, our lives can never be the same. Never. If he's Lord, we're forgiven over and over again for any offense. We get grace. We get mercy every single day. If he's Lord, we have to look to this seriously. We have to take this seriously. We have to look at the accounts that he wrote and he said and that his followers wrote down and say, man, I need to let them have authority in my life. If he's Lord, why would we not invite others on a journey with Jesus? As is the mission statement of Journey Point. If he's Lord, it changes everything. Absolutely everything. It's the linchpin of Christianity. I mean, if he's Lord, it's like finding the cure to cancer. And we would be screaming from the mountaintops that we have that. If he's Lord, we come and we gather to worship and to serve him. 
and to be involved in connect groups and to be involved in our disciple making groups where we understand this Bible as much as we can more and more. If he's Lord, we love the way he loved. Everyone, every time, everywhere, unconditionally. If he's Lord, we forgive. We try to meet the needs of those around us, like these backpack drives that we're trying to do. If he's Lord, we do those things. So there's two people in the room. <laughs> there's those that say, he's Lord. And, and you know, there's even a subgroup of those people that said, maybe a while ago I said he was Lord, but my life doesn't look like I think he's Lord. And then there's people that just say, I don't think he is. I'm unsure, I don't know, but right now I can't claim that he's Lord. The next step for either of those people in here is to say, man, if he's Lord, if the Bible is reliable, if God is who he says he is and Jesus is Lord, what do I do next to begin embracing that, believing that, trusting that and then living it out what do i do to live out that truth today what can i do my very next step to make my life look like he is lord